So let's talk a little bit about common escrow issues and some violations. So escrow gets opened, and when it gets opened, the title company runs what's called a preliminary report that's usually requested by the listing agent, all right? Now, I know that under Section 9 of RESPA, um, yeah, Section 9, I was having a brain fart there, uh, it is sellers are not allowed to require buyers to pay for settlement services from a specific company. And if you've listened to that course, um, or for those of you that were here earlier, you remember that I told you the trick to that is the rule says that you are not allowed to require buyers to purchase uh, settlement services from a company the seller picked. Now, the key to that term there was purchase. So if the seller is actually paying both sides of the title, the owner's policy and the lender's policy, then he in fact is allowed to pick that, all right? So I said that because I also now need to say, sometimes I have heard title companies, and I know one specifically here in Indiana that will not run a preliminary title report when a property gets listed. If they do, they actually want to charge you for it. Yes, believe it or not. Because they understand that if a buyer comes in with a purchase offer and asks for another title company, which they have the right to do, that the company that spent time pulling the preliminary title would in fact lose the deal, all right? So I know that there are some issues about pulling preliminary title and some companies, I can name one in fact, and I promised I wouldn't name their name, will not pull a preliminary title. They wait or they will only pull the title work once the purchase agreement comes in. Now, the funny thing to me that is, I am sure that this title company has been the recipient of the other side of this, where some other listing agent may have pulled title prelim from another title company and the buyer comes in and says, no, I want to use this one. And they have received the benefit of Section 9 of RESPA, but they certainly don't want to <clears throat> suffer the wrath of Section 9 of RESPA, so to speak. So typically that's when escrow's opened is when the prelim's done or the TBD. Um, the lender gets a copy of that prelim title work. The agent can get a copy of that prelim title work and so should the client. That is so that the client can actually see what is listed as far as liens to make sure that what the seller thinks they have, they actually have as liens. Now remember, those liens don't tell the exact payoff. This is a misconception. The liens tell, the lien that's listed will tell the initial amount that was listed and there has to be some math and other stuff done if you want the exact number, which is why we call and get the payoff on a certain date, all right? Um, make sure that they read the exceptions section, section B2, so that they understand that there could be other liens on there that they may have exceptions to. Um, title insurance is very important because it's what protects the buyer and the seller to some extent so that nothing is missed in the search and that the conveyance is legal, valid, and proper, all right? Remember that policy or that insurance policy only goes into effect the day of closing moving forward. It does not protect anything when the seller sees something and goes, holy crap, I didn't know this. Well, that's of record, the insurance company hasn't written the policy yet. It would have to go back to the previous conveyance insurance company. So common issues can kind of be lumped into four or five different categories. Each category could have several 
reasons or examples with inside of it, all right? One of the most common issues, or not the most common, but some common issues is where the seller may not have the proper authority to sell, meaning trust accounts, heirs, estates, corporations, uh, even just fraudulently don't have the authority to sell. So that's something that has to be looked at. The title search could find clouds on the title, could be a broken chain, there could be heirs that were, that had never signed off. There could be, you know, bankruptcies in the middle of that chain with foreclosures. There could be all kinds of other clouds that have to be dealt with. Then you get the whole issue of cold feet. One party or the other may have cold feet in with respect to actually just legally closing this. Now I'm not talking about a contingency that was in place that didn't get met like financing. I'm talking about literally, you know, a buyer wakes up and goes, hey, I don't like purple. I'm not buying that house. So we'll talk about that. Uh, the next one is the failure to meet contingencies. Uh, in the purchase agreement, there could be several contingencies. Could be an appraisal contingency. Could be contingent upon the buyer selling his current home. There theoretically could be any contingency that both the parties agree to. Subject to my dog singing the alphabet before noon tomorrow. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, that's what the problem is. Sometimes my brain works that way and that's what scares my wife most of the time is examples like that. Then you get this problem where the property may not be insurable. And I mean from a title aspect. There could be so many issues that the insurance company is just going to go, hey, you know, we, you, uh, that would be equivalent to, you know, you buying a Ferrari and going to the general and go, hey, I want to get Ferrari car insurance on my Ferrari, but I got 47 speeding tickets and 18 seatbelt violations. They're going to go, no, dude, we're not writing a policy on, on this particular vehicle or you. So that can happen as well. And we're going to talk about each one of these and some different examples of where you might see them and some of the issues, some of the solutions and ways to avoid them in advance. All right, sit back, refill your coffee. We're going to move on to the next topic.